Sometimes people do silly, stupid things. It just goes with the whole nature of being human. For the most part, the consequences for our own strange behavior aren't too bad. We might embarrass ourselves, but a lot of people will look on and know that they've done something just as odd. Over in the land of history and information, and invention, the areas we draw our inspiration from can be surprising. Indeed, they can be downright astonishing. It's amazing how something so simple can break down so quickly. See, back in ancient Greece around the 6th century BCE, a mathematical genius named Pythagoras discovered he had a problem with his solution. Not the kind of solution you pour from a bottle, mind you, but the kind you work out mathematically. Pythagoras is famous for an equation that simply says that, given a right triangle, there is a relationship between the lengths of the horizontal side, the vertical side, and the third side, which is called the hypotenuse. To put it in simple terms, the square of the horizontal added to the square of the vertical equals the square of the hypotenuse. But there's a problem, a big one actually, and it was driven into secrecy by Pythagoras and his followers. See, if you have a right triangle where the vertical is one meter long and the horizontal is one meter long, then your hypotenuse is equal to the square root of two. The problem is, Pythagoras believed that numbers were rational orderly and not given to just running on into infinity. Unfortunately, the square root of 2 isn't a rational number. It can never be fully resolved, and the numbers after the decimal point fly off into infinity without ever establishing a pattern. Needless to say, Pythagoras wasn't too happy with this. It shook his faith in the power and the certainty of numbers. Thankfully, he had other interests to take his mind off things, albeit they too were math-related. He was keen on music, not just for its beauty, but because music is an expression of numbers, timing, and indeed a mathematical equation of its very own. In the time of the ancient Greeks, though, music had a bit of a problem, too. Come here, I'll show you. See, if you wanted to play a song, you either had to have heard the song before, or try and take a guess off of what passed as musical notation at the time. Modern musicians use a method similar to what the ancient Greeks had when they refer to a song's tabs. Now, the tabs for a song are usually little more than the indication of what chord or key to play. It gives an experienced musician some hints. If the musicians listened to the song before, then chances are he or she can figure it out from the song's tabs. If this is very similar to the ancient Greek method of writing music. A few simple indications of what to play, but it provided nothing on the melody, the timing, or the rhythm. Music remained in this state for a long time until a group of people with an interest in standardizing music came along. We call them the Catholic Church. In medieval Europe, the church wanted to standardize the songs they sang because they figured that hymns were important enough that everybody should sing them properly. 
Several members of the clergy looked into the matter, and it was a monk named Guido of Arezzo who finally did the trick. Somewhere between 1025 and 1026, Guido published a book called the Macrologus. It came to be the second most popular book on music during the Middle Ages, surpassed only by the works of both of us. In this book, he created many of the things that we use today in modern musical writing. Things like notes on lines, measures, and that stuff. He also created the first solfeggio, or the do-re-mi scale of music. Guido got his start at a church in a monastery in Pamposa near the town of Ferrara in northern Italy. At the time, though, there was no Italy. In a way, it was kind of like Greece, where each city was a state or a kingdom unto itself. So war between cities wasn't at all uncommon. From 984, Ferrara was a city under the rule of the Count of Moderna and Canossa, a man named Tadaldo. Apparently, they weren't too happy with Tadaldo, and they declared their independence. But there's a downside. See, when a town declares its independence, they have to fend for themselves. And Ferrara was in no position to do that in 1101 when one of the few well-remembered women of medieval history came storming into town. Matilda of Tuscany was a true warrior woman. From an early age, she received training in the theoretical side of military tactics, and also the very practical side of how to properly kill someone with a lance. She was, as some would say, a liberated woman. Lances are actually quite the weapon, if for nothing else than the psychological effect, which is actually most of what it's good for. Asking foot soldiers to hold the line while mounted cavalry bears down on them with lances at the ready is a dicey proposition at best. There were many instances where these foot soldiers just broke ranks and ran for the hills rather than getting torn apart by the large, long, and pointy object coming towards them at a full gallop. So it's not too surprising to find out that the lance enjoyed a long and useful lifestyle when it came to the matters of mass killing. Indeed, there were still mounted warriors attempting lance attacks during World War I. Before that, however, the lance saw action at the close of the 19th century during the Second Boer War. Looking back at the tactics and the events of that war, it's hard not to see it as a dress rehearsal for World War I. Technology was changing the tactics of warfare, and the Boers were using something, well, two things actually, that spelled the true and final end of the lance as a going weapon. First, they utilized a new tactic called trench warfare. When you are the mounted cavalryman aside his gallant steed, lance in hand and ready to do some good work for king and country, you'll find it nearly impossible to do anything useful to a man taking cover in a trench. That wasn't such a problem for the Lancer as the next little invention the Boers threw at the Brits. Ironically, the invention was a British design by way of America. More on that in a second. It revolutionized the face of war and continues to do so today. After all, why fear a man on horseback carrying an antiquated weapon when you're packing the very latest thing? A machine gun. Sir Hiram Maxim started life as an American something he was terribly sorry about, and he immigrated to the UK as soon as he got the chance. Inspired by a friend's advice that if he really wanted to make a pile of cash, he should invent something that made it easier for the Europeans to kill each other. And so he did exactly that. In the late 1880s, he patented three types of automatic firearms using recoil, gas, and blowback operations. Turns out his friend was right. When the Boers got a hold of the Maxim gun, they tore their enemies to pieces. No longer did a soldier have to take aim and fire. Merely spraying an area with large quantities of hot lead would be enough to kill. Like the lance before it, the very sound of a Maxim gun was demoralizing, especially if your side didn't have one readily available. As you might expect, the Maxim gun made Sir Hiram Maxim a very wealthy man. Still, Sir Hiram wasn't all blood and money. He enjoyed making things. He was an inventor. And one of his inventions was a much kinder, gentler thing designed to amuse. After all, that's what amusement parks are for. Maxim had a love of helicopters, something far ahead of his time. He worked on designs for aircraft capable of vertical takeoff and even created something that lifted off under its own power. 
but the machine was dangerously unstable. So Maxim turned to the next best thing, carnival rides. He designed a ride he called Captive Flying Machines. His original idea was to make a sort of merry-go-round with separate cars equipped with their own airfoils. This way the rider would have some control over their own car, at least partially. Thankfully, authorities said this was incredibly unsafe and outlawed it. Still, a version of the device got built and you can find various styles of it at fairs, parks, carnivals around the world. One of the more famous examples of a captive flying machine ride is the Golden Zephyr at the Disney California Adventure Park. The engineers who worked on that ride took the trip to England to study Maxim's original schematics and the, and the ride itself that eventually saw the lights of the Midway. Yet, Maxim's creation wasn't their only source of inspiration. The engineers and designers of the Golden Zephyr wanted to give the ride a sort of retro science fiction feel. For that, they turned to the pulp science fiction magazines of the 1930s and 40s. A look at the Golden Zephyr takes you back to the halcyon days where high adventure in outer space meant curling up with the science fiction magazine and the adventures of Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. The spaceships in those stories weren't as new and futuristic as some people might think. Even at the time, the cover art on the magazines portrayed a new style of art that was flourishing. A look at these rocket ships shows a sleekness of form and lines with a leaning towards geometrical shapes and styles. This was something very in vogue at the time, and the artistic style came to be called Art Deco. But let's not take the highbrow art road. No, I think something a little more common and popular might be in order. So let's look instead at those pulp magazines, shall we? One of the biggest magazines at the time was Amazing. No, that's the title of the magazine itself, though it was pretty astounding. No, wait, that's the title of a different magazine. Anyway, a slightly crooked man named Hugo Gernsbach founded the magazine in 1926 to publish these fantastic new stories that he called science fiction. Yes, Hugo is credited with coining the term. You've also heard of him because it's his name that graces the award given out to science fiction and fantasy authors for the best stories of the year, the Hugo. Now, I say he was slightly crooked, but that's no hard reflection upon him because many magazine editors did the same things, which included paying low rates to writers and then paying them very slowly. The going joke amongst pulp writers was fractions of a cent per word, payable upon lawsuit. It was almost the accepted way of doing business. That's why pulp writers wrote so much and in so many different genres. It literally paid to diversify. Still, that didn't keep influential writers like H.P. Lovecraft from calling him a rat. Nevertheless, his magazine kicked off the science fiction genre, and though he filed for bankruptcy in 1929 and thus lost the magazine, Amazing went on in the hands of others. It provided a forum and a launching point for many popular authors to come, like Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein, for instance. Incidentally, the pulp magazine started to really suffer during World War II. Not only because money was tight, but because many of their writers got drafted and were involved in the war effort. That's why Asimov and Heinlein found themselves working with each other at the Philadelphia Naval Yard, a location with a reputation for science fiction in its own right. Why? Well, the tale goes that in 1943, a U.S. destroyer, the USS Eldridge, took part in a scientific experiment having to do with camouflage. Now, what we're talking about painting the ships some wild shapes and colors, which is actually what they did to ships back then. No, we're talking about invisibility fields, something designed to make the ship disappear from sight. Supposedly, the Navy outfitted this ship with some equipment and turned it on, and then what happens next depends on which version of the story you'd like to hear. Some say a greenish fog replaced the ship, which was totally gone. Others reported that the ship was teleported to a location offshore. Then again, there are some who claim the ship traveled back in time. Some say the seamen were fused with parts of the destroyer. Others simply disappeared, or at the outside, they all got nausea. See what I mean? It's a story straight out of a pulp science fiction magazine. To date, when people think of military conspiracy theories, the Philadelphia experiment is sure to come up. 
It's no matter that the Navy denies this ever happened. I mean, that's just part of the cover-up, right? Never mind that the science is totally removed from reality. After all, why would the military ever release such knowledge into the public sphere? In the end, it's just one of those tales that people think has a nugget of truth to it, and so they choose to believe it, no matter how irrational it actually is. I mean, it's just silly. Things don't just disappear. 